Hello, I'm very happy to be able to join you on video, even though I'm unable to join the live conference session. I was delighted to be asked to provide some input into the session because decarbonisation is a topic I've been close to for several decades in Shell. My name is Jeremy and I recently retired as head of Shell Scenarios and a member of the corporate strategy leadership team. And this is being recorded just as COP27 kicks off in Egypt, while you'll be listening to it after the COP has concluded. So I'm confident that others will refer to the pluses and minuses emerging from this milestone along the long path of international intergovernmental negotiations. And these are important because they frame and reflect many developments in the world. But there are so many facets to this journey that some of the fundamentals can become obscured. So I just want to highlight again a few of these fundamentals and to ask you to ask yourselves, with these in mind, what can you do to help accelerate decarbonisation? First of all, it's long been clear that decarbonisation is an urgent priority and that the world is not yet anywhere near to being on a pathway to avoid extremely damaging climate changes. It requires completely rewiring the world economy to change the way we use energy from fossil fuels to operate, build and move everything we do. Also changing the way we're degrading natural systems through, for example, deforestation and, and soil erosion. Approximately two-thirds of emissions come from our use of energy and one-third from our abuse of nature. Now these are not small tasks, but there is progress and there are points of light, such as the rapid pace of growth in power generation from solar and wind, sales of electric vehicles, the spread of carbon markets and the commitments to decarbonisation. Now these are far from sufficient, but they were not there 10 years ago, and yet today they are. Our goal now is to accelerate progress by continuing to promote these changes, and, and crucially, by lighting the blue touch paper so that multiple additional changes take off at pace as well. Technically, we know what is required. Multiple scenarios, including shells, highlight four core technical areas. First of all, energy efficiency. And, and this is not just about appliances, but about integrating infrastructures far more efficiently, uh, like power, heat, waste and water, uh, different modes of transport. Secondly, power generation from renewable and other non-fossil sources. Number three, deep electrification of the economy. Up from the 20% of total energy use now to 60%, so that power generation from renewables can grow to have much more impact on the whole system. Number four, substitution of liquid and gaseous fuels. There are sectors that are hard to electrify because energy dense, portable, thermal molecular fuels are required, you know, like in heavy transport and heavy industry. So progressively shifting from fossil oil to biofuels and natural gas to hydrogen based alternatives is important. And then finally, number five, carbon removals, mopping up emissions, both through technical approaches like carbon dioxide capture and storage and nature-based approaches like reforestation. We understand that technical challenges are different in different sectors of the economy. 
and we've all successfully been promoting sectoral perspectives for addressing these. I'm glad to know that in this conference there will be contributions from multiple business sectors as well as from an infrastructure perspective which I've also already highlighted as, as being important. Um, the challenges, however, now come less on the technical side than in that nexus of economic, social and political factors that determine behaviour. Now this is reflected in a theme from this conference that decarbonisation must meet affordability, accessibility and acceptability tests. It should be well understood by now that the macroeconomic drag of investing in energy transitions will be rather modest and likely to be much less than the drag that would be imposed by damage from climate change itself if the shifts are not made. The challenge is at the micro level as the costs and the benefits are not evenly distributed or aligned. Now this is a really tricky problem of coordinating and aligning the interests and motivations of, of more or less everybody. Yeah, this needs new policies and regulations, new market designs, new pricing mechanisms, business developments and changes in supply changes. Effective alignment demands much more vigorous collaboration across public, private, industry and, and business boundaries. Now this should all be fairly familiar by now to many of you. But I also want you to grapple with a couple of other thoughts. That will probably help me grapple with them as well. You see, much of modern progress has been driven by a combination of collaboration in enterprises to, to get big things done and also competition in markets that give financial incentives for effective activity. We've recently seen both of these mechanisms play out powerfully in the astonishingly fast development and deployment of COVID vaccines with intensive collaboration and knowledge sharing across worldwide scientific and clinical communities, but also competition among different organizations and even countries to deliver their new best vaccines to market as quickly as possible. I see similar mechanisms in play, looking back at several energy transition developments that have already taken off. We now take these for granted. Alignments have created fertile ground. Pioneers have acted decisively and demonstrated possibilities. Then many others have followed to avoid being left behind. Hence, industries have taken off growing at perhaps 20, 30 or 40% per year globally as deployment then drives down costs and initiates a virtuous cycle. You saw that with the takeoff in light duty electric vehicles. Now, these had been toyed with for many years, but then business pioneer Elon Musk recognized the attractive conditions that had come together in California to enable Tesla to initiate a new kind of super premium computer on wheels electric vehicle business. This then triggered a global EV takeoff as other manufacturers and policymakers elsewhere responded to Tesla's early successes. Now we see the market value of Tesla is more than 10 times that of traditional vehicle behemoths like General Motors or Ford, and indeed almost four times that of Shell. Recognizing the importance of competitive dynamics and pioneers is the key to catalyzing the multiple takeoffs of additional developments that we need to decarbonize the economy. You see, when developments take off, they really take off vigorously because the competitive engine 
flips the industry equilibrium as soon as a pioneer demonstrates potential attractiveness. Multiple players then act quickly as so-called fear of missing out is activated by the pioneer. It may take time for background alignments and the pioneers to emerge, but once they do, takeoff growth can become almost explosive. Just look at the global growth percentages in solar, wind, and electric vehicle technologies. Actually, at this point, I believe the market for hydrogen fuels is primed for such a takeoff, with demand growth being primed in industrial clusters and in heavy transport, and supportive policy signaled in those giant demand centers of the United States, Europe, and China through things like the Inflation Reduction Act, Repower EU and Fit for 55, and the five-year plan. More businesses and policymakers need to recognize this explosive dynamic better and not be misled simply because of the extended time taken to initiate growth initially. They have to recognize this explosive dynamic. And this dynamic also demands a re-perceiving of the potential financial value of being a business pioneer, and also the value to domestic industrial competitiveness of being a policy pioneer. When the outlook is for an explosive growth opportunity at some point in the future, but we don't know whether it could be in three, six, nine, or 12 years time, it is not a useful model to guess some fantasy average annual revenue in future and simply apply a discount rate to account for the time dimension. Instead, the key question is whether to pre-invest now in building competitive strength for an industry that may take several years to take off and in so doing potentially catalyze an early takeoff. Or, alternatively, whether to delay investment and react later when growth is already established, but strong competitive positions are more difficult to secure. In other words, whether to be a pioneer on the front foot or a follower on the back foot. Now looked at with that model, my estimates indicate that there is usually a much greater economic value opportunity in being a pioneer than most people recognize when they get caught in those traditional paradigms. Now, of course, not all pioneering activities will succeed over the long term if competitive strongholds cannot be secured or if it takes forever for takeoff to occur. Nevertheless, the vibrancy of the venture capital markets and the examples of companies like Tesla, Orsted and Next Era Energy show what can be achieved. So, to close out this personal perspective on decarbonization, we know technically what to do. We know the big challenges are in the socio-political economic space. We know the importance of building alignments within and across economic sectors. And we know the importance of initiating the takeoff growth of multiple new developments. In addition, I also firmly believe that we all need to be more attentive than we currently are to the importance of the competitive engine and business pioneering in both driving acceleration and business value. So, my question for all of us interested in this topic is what roles can we play in building alignments, catalyzing takeoffs, and emphasizing 
the underappreciated economic value of being a pioneer. Because that is where smart business, smart policies, and smart politics come together. Thank you very much for watching.